Hi, everyone, and welcome to Golf's Next Gen, the official podcast of the American Junior Golf Association. My name is Tim Jackman. I'm going to go over here first. That is Justin over there, the producer, <laughs> and that over there is Thomas. Um, we have another great episode today. We actually have Mike Thomas is going to be on with us. Um, and if you're not familiar, that's Justin Thomas's dad, who is also a very successful um, teacher and PGA professional. Um, he's got some amazing advice for parents, um, so definitely want to tune in for that. But um, I want to also mention, too, that you can catch us on uh, uh, Apple Podcasts. You can also listen to us on Spotify and on Amazon Music, as well as YouTube, which is where the video portion of this is, too. So, uh, Thomas, what you got for me this morning or this afternoon? I don't know what time it is. Yeah, so... Um you know, we're big multi-sport fans here, and it's kind of a lull in the golf period, uh, that part of the season. So before golf gets back fired up, I feel like a lot of us around here have been watching a lot of basketball, college basketball uh, tipping off here. And it got me thinking, again, back oh, to no. our classic argument. Oh, no. Our golfers athletes. If you had to make a starting five of a basketball team out of professional golfers, who are you rocking with? Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, I knew this would put you in a blender. Oh, gosh. You know, I, I feel like... I don't know why Brooks Kepka keeps coming to my mind. Yeah. I just feel like... Feels like an athlete. Brooksy would just be... He would just be good. Probably at like the... Do I have to assign the positions, or can I just say five? I think you could get five, and we could probably work in the positions okay. later. I do think Brooksy's probably on the list. Yeah. Brooks Kepka is on there. I'm also I also feel like maybe Colin Morikawa. I think I might I might him. he seems shifty. Yeah, seems shifty. Max Homa. He just seems like that dude at the Y that's just throwing up threes all the time. <laughs> and, Corner specialist. <laughs> um Oh jeez, I don't know. This was clearly just you just surprised me with this today, so I don't know. Yeah, you're I, welcome. I'm trying to think. <laughs> give me, give me one. Let's just make a combined one. How about I that? I think one that you're drastically underestimating here is you can't tell me John Rahm is embodying oh. people at the four. Yeah, that's fair. Like if he's down low in the post, like he's he's putting bodies on the floor. That guy. I also think Tony. Like Tony looks Ooh. like a shooter. I like, feel like he'd have like a silky smooth. That's jump like shot. just long arms jump shooter, like a a real KD type. So <laughs> I think like. Those two, like, instantly came to mind. Those are some of my first two. Okay. But I don't hate where you're at with, like, the Max Homa being the guy at the Y. Yeah. I mean, everybody's jumper. seen. everybody has seen that guy who you're like, okay, I don't want to offend Max Homa. But, you know, like, you've seen that guy, and you're like, this guy's not going to. And then he just goes out there, and he just balls out. But yeah. he doesn't play defense. He just yeah. he just doesn't play defense at all. He just goes and shoots three. Like, that's a guy who shows up in the slides he's carrying the shoes like hood up he's just sitting in the corner laces him up like doesn't say a word to anybody yeah and then drops 30 on him. i'll put i would put max home at, at the at the three i think okay interesting i'm gonna I, i'm gonna do my own five i i think i'm gonna do rom at the four i think i'm gonna do brooks at the well i think i do rom at the four brooks at the three maybe max at the two Call it the one, and then I got. I need a big man. Oh, geez, I don't know. I'm tempted to say Scotty, but uh, I don't know. I, I can't. I can't. Give me a five. I think you've got a couple interesting options. I like Adrian Moronk comes to mind. <laughs> As like a, that's just a big guy. That's, that's a, a big body. That's a pull. It's a long, that seems like, that's just a center's name, like Moronk. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. That's a dude you see in the Olympics and you're like, where is this guy been? <laughs> like somebody give this guy a contract. Okay. I like that. I think Christo Lamprecht, obviously. Again, just yeah, long. He's, he's kind of scrawny long, though. He's kind of like built like me. Kind of bit like a Zadrunas Ilgauskas. Again, I know we're getting some deep, deep <laughs> cuts here. As I'm pulling these names, most of the people listening, they're just like, "What?" The they have no idea. We've already doing? we've already lost anyone under the age of 25 <laughs> listening to this. But this is I feel like this one's more for you and me. Just okay. having okay having this debate here. I feel I feel like Peak Tiger would have actually been pretty good too. Peak Tiger is undoubtedly Michael Jordan at the two. Yeah, I feel like he would have been he would have been really good like Peak. Um, I feel like he and Phil were legit like. <laughs> 
like Phil just strikes me as a Larry Bird type, or again, you're just like, I don't see him being good, and then you're like, how is this guy as good as he is? <laughs> right. Like right. just with the build, but yeah, no, I think you've got some options. It was just interesting, you know. I love thinking about those cross sports. Like, yeah, you always see people talking about, oh, if you didn't play the sport, what would you do? In nine times out of ten, the athletes just say a different sport. Right. I'm like, right. all right, let's put this to the test. I definitely feel like Max is. T- I feel like he'd be my number one pick. I don't know. I just get. I just get a feeling about Max. I love the thought of Colin running point. Yeah. I think he's. I think we got that down. I I do too. Good hands. He's got great short game. I think I think that's where it's at. He's just sneaky. Lockdown defender. He's getting like eight steals a game. I like it. Absolutely. You know, one guy we did not mention on that on that list was Justin Thomas, who I believe actually played a little basketball when he was younger. So that's a perfect segue, I think, <laughs> to our guest today. Um, so we're really excited to talk to Mike here. So I think we'll just go ahead and bring him on here and, and get into that. I think he's going to have some great advice for parents. So, uh, Mike, thanks so much for coming on with us today. Really appreciate that and everything um, that you're going to bring to the table. Yep. Okay. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, why don't you kind of start, and as I'm thinking about this, just what do you remember most about being a, a junior golf parent of a high-level junior golfer? Let's start there. Well, um, you probably should have my wife on here because she did uh, most all of that. I mean, I was working 10, 12 hours a day at, at my club, and, uh, you know, the fortunate part for me uh, with Justin taking an early interest in golf, uh, is I got to see him a lot more than I would have with, with the hours that I kept at my job. Um, you know, I never pushed him to play or anything. He just kind of at a very young age, uh, wanted to come out and hit balls all the time. So, uh, you know, it worked out great for me that I got to uh, see him all the time out there, but most all the junior tournaments, my wife took him to, I would go to the ones that were local if they were in Louisville. Uh, I would, I would make it down to him, uh, if my schedule permitted, uh, but my wife, she, she was the, she was the travel, travel person. Oh, very cool. And some of those early tournaments, I know um, we've talked about in previous episodes where, you know, you don't always see results right away. Um, I think his first tournament with the AJGA was a T51 finish um, at an event in the Quad Cities. And so obviously you work with him quite a bit. What was, or if you remember kind of those conversations like of, how do you keep your head up? How do you keep pushing forward through some of those early finishes that may not be quite where you want them to be? You know, he's always had a, uh, a really good head on his shoulders uh, for, from that re- regard. I mean, he put a lot of pressure on himself to, to do well at, at a very early age and obviously had tons of success when he started playing in tournaments like at seven or eight years old. Uh, I forgot all about that tournament. Uh, in the quad cities, but now I do remember my wife taking him over there. Um, you know, I think he understood, I mean, he, he couldn't have been probably 13 when he played in that. So I think he understood that, you know, he was not going to be able to compete against these older kids. So, you know, we constantly kind of reminded him when he played up in age groups that, you know, uh, a top 10 or a top 20, depending on what the tournament was, would, would be, you know, a really nice finish. And, and it was a, a learning experience for him. So, you know, we, we just tried to take everything we could from each event and what need to, to get better and, and, you know, what did he learn from it and, and so forth. Yeah. We have a couple of pictures of him, of him from those first events and he was a, uh, Quite small, I think, would be the way that you would describe him. He was <laughs> how, tiny. How is, yeah. How has that kind of played into his development as a golfer, and how have you kind of coached him through that, um, just kind of the size thing? Because he's not he's not the biggest guy for sure, even now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was – it's funny. Uh, you know, I have so many students that come and see me, and they don't hit it very far. They're 10 years old, or, you know, they may be a tiny 12-year-old, and – the frustration of, you know, they're hitting woods into these holes and, uh, and that they're, uh, can't reach greens and so forth. And I tell them right up front, you know, I have no sympathy for you whatsoever. I go, because when Justin started playing AJGA events, uh, at a young age, he was obviously competing against uh, a lot older kids and he was by far the shortest in every field that he played in, uh, until he was like, 15 or 16, he still was behind most everybody then. And I would, uh, we would talk at night on the phone after a practice round and I'd say, what's the number? And he'd go six. And that was the number of holes he couldn't reach. 
uh, in regulation. <laughs> so, you know, we harped, and I do this with all my young students today that don't hit it very far, or if they hit it far, it's still important that, you know, you have to outthink everybody and you have to out chip and putt everybody because you're not going to out hit anybody. So you can't afford any mental mistakes. You can't afford uh, course management mistakes. And, you know, you can't afford to not get up and down for 50 yards because that's where you're going to be making your pars. And so obviously he started to master some of those things and have a lot of success there. At what point did you, it kind of start to creep in the mind that, okay, he can really kind of make a run at this and compete at the highest level in the world? You know, media always ask uh, me that question. And I was very realistic. Uh, you know, I'm surrounded by a lot of good players. You know, I played competitively myself. And I saw, like, even in the Kentucky section or in the tri-state section where I was before uh, Kentucky, you know, I saw how the best club pros played so I realized the talent level that was out there, even at that stage. And, you know, I had no shortage of members or no shortage of friends that told me all these things that Justin was going to accomplish in the future. And, and I would always say, you know, how do you know that? I mean, I, I'm not projecting out to that. Um, I'm more living in the present of, you know, he's enjoying what he's doing. He's good at what he's doing. He has a passion for something. And those were the important things for me. And uh, the one thing that I always was surprised about is that impressed me throughout his young career from literally six or seven years old on is the tighter the situation, the, the higher the pressure or the more that was demanded of him, the better he performed. And that's not something that you could teach, you know, e either, you know, Michael Jordan, when he was 12 or whatever, you know, you either want the ball or you don't. And and he always wanted the ball. He he sought out those pressure situations and he always performed better in them than he did. Like if he was 10th or 11th, you know, he didn't play very well because there was no heat on him. He, you know, he couldn't catch the leader or something. And those were his most lackadaisical rounds. Whereas I, I would say, hey, if you're 10th, try to get the ninth. You know, if you're ninth, try to get to eighth. You know, and we still do this today uh, on tour is just like, hey, just pass somebody up. You know, if you're back there in 40th, try to get to 35th. And, and I mean, it keeps you sharp because it's easy, even on tour, for someone that's back there in 40th or 50th place on a Sunday to just go mail in a 71 or 72 and, you know, finish 50th where they're at. And, um, you know, that was a big learning curve for him. And he's, he's really good at that now. And, and he was good at it at an early age. So I guess that's a long answer. But to answer your question, I, I never really knew he was going to do something until he got through Q school. And then I really never knew he was going to do something until he won his first web.com event and which it was called then. And then obviously when he won his first event in Malaysia, the CIMB, you know, that's when it really kind of hit me that, wow, he's, he's succeeding in, in doing this. Uh, it, it was, you know, it was an interesting cycle for sure. Yeah. Do you, I think that's really awesome, just kind of that, that mental approach, because I think a lot of the junior golf parents we deal with, I've dealt with a lot of the same stuff that you did. People telling them, your kid's going to be, you know, the next Tiger Woods, the next Michelle Wee or whoever. And um, what's your kind of advice or, or thoughts to them on that? Yeah, you know, I, I hear that. Uh, not only did I hear about Justin all the time, and I always deflected it. And, I mean, my, my stock answer every single time that somebody said that, uh, I'll just repeat what I said earlier is, look, he's having fun. He has a passion for something. And whether that passion is to be an attorney or a doctor or a CPA or that passion is to work for the AJGA, just be proud that they have a passion for something because they're going to see that having a passion for something leads to success in that area. So I would always say, look, if he, if he quits golf when he's 15, he understands what passion will do if he trades golf in for baseball, if he trades golf in for engineering, he understands what passion and hard work can accomplish. So that's always what we talk about. We never project. I mean, I know Justin at an early age wanted to play the tour. He had all these dreams and, and hopes. And we, I, I, his mother and I never really 
we didn't focus on that. We, we just said, look, just continue being a good kid, treat, treat people right. And, and work hard at whatever you choose to do and, and just see where it takes you. And, and that's, that's true in any walk of life. I mean, Tim, you know, I, I see, I, I don't want to say bad parenting, but I see bad approaches to their kids a lot more often than I see good approaches. And it's funny when, when I get a new student, and their mother or father brings them out it's often their father um they'll always say well i guess you just want me to to stay stay back here and i always go no no come out i want you to come out on the tee with me and they're always shocked at that they think that i don't want them out there and my purpose is i want to see those two interact uh, <laughs> yeah. because i can tell five minutes in that if i ask a young student a question the first thing he does is look at his parent uh, and i go no 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 i'm, I'm asking you look at me i'm asking you i want your opinion of this and so i can see that dynamic immediately and obviously i've seen it thousands of times over my career and you know teaching a lot of non-members I, I have the benefit of you know i couldn't do this to a member's father or parent <laughs> uh but with a lot of non-members you know i'm able to lay it on the line to them that look I, I, i'm i'm taking them two steps forward and you're taking him a step backwards this is this is you know your role and i say this to parents i go your role is to support him emotionally and financially as much as you can and him improving and understanding the game that's my role and all you can do is support him and stay positive and, and those are the things that are most important to your relationship and then my relationship with him as a teacher, it, you know, my role is to help him get better. I think it's funny that you mentioned that, Mike, because we um, at our tournaments, I'm sure you're familiar with your event. When we do the registration process, we a lot of times get people who are asking, oh, can I just register for my son or daughter? And we say, no, we want them answering the questions. It's just it may be a little thing, but it's just one of those life skills, just a little development thing. hundred um, percent. I mean, for you having having them write those cards that's literally like Justin and Janie and I's favorite part of that event is when we get those cards a week or two later and we read them. And I mean, that's don't ever stop doing that. That's such an important thing that they do is they get to sit down and express their feelings in a card instead of texting it or, or emailing it or something. And I mean, that's just like you say, it's a little thing, but it's a life skill, you know, write down how you feel towards the, your sponsor, or towards your host, or towards your event. And I, I just think that's really cool. Yeah, those are awesome. We, I mean, it probably doesn't surprise you how many sponsors or golf courses or whatever that have come back or have such a positive view of the AJGA or we've been able to do so much more with because of, of those thank you notes. And it's kind of shocking to me that more organizations, not just us or not just in golf or whatever, don't do something like that because – that is such an impactful thing for the juniors, obviously, but also like on the sponsors and, and the, the impact and the positive view of the AJGA that they have as well. Yeah, when Justin started uh, getting taken care of by Titleist with balls or gloves or shoes or something, every single time that he got something, I said from day one, I said, you send them, you're going to send them a handwritten thank you note. And when he asked why, I my simple answer was because nobody else will. That's right. I go, you, if you get three dozen balls in the mail from them, I got, I got their address for you and their name, and you're going to write them a short thank you note, and we're going to put a stamp on it and mail it to them and because you're the only one that's going to do that. And, you know, to this day, I mean, the family that we have with Titleist and his other sponsors, uh, you know, I think that's a big part of it. I mean, he, they understood how much he appreciated what they did you know, they didn't have to send him balls and gloves and so forth. And, and they did. And I said, you know, tell them you appreciate it. I mean, they know you appreciate it. Send them a note. Tell them you appreciate it. Yeah. No, I think it's super cool seeing those things and hearing how it impacts you guys being involved with the event. It impacts everyone else. And you more than anybody having gone through it as a parent and as a coach to other people probably see a lot of that development of the youth and some of those skills. And so I'm sure it's fairly rewarding to see those skills that maybe you're teaching them in golf translate into the everyday life. I always uh, said you can, it's not hard to see the parenting skills when I'm talking to the child. 
and 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 i'll tell the parents I'll, I'll tell the good ones i go man you're doing a great job with him or her i go you know she's she's very mature for her age her her iq is high about the questions i ask and she's you, you i can tell you've made her think for herself and uh you know i think one of the worst things in junior golf is these events that allow their parents to caddy and it's like you know let this kid figure this out on their own you know that's that's part of their growth and, and they're going to learn it a lot quicker when they're out there making their own mistakes than you correcting them before they have a chance to i mean the only way we're going to learn is by making mistakes so having a mom or a dad out there tell them no this is a seven iron no hit it left you know don't do this do that they're not learning anything other than take instruction from you right read read this do that type of deal nothing no adapting or anything like that do you have any uh do you have any fun or funny stories about justin's junior golf days or just you know younger golf days um that you could share um well there's a lot of stories uh i don't know who uh or what place I want to put on the spot. I mean, there are a lot of funny stories. Uh, one of them, uh, you know, as you know, we, we have balls from all his wins. And uh, I think he was eight years old or something. And uh, my wife drove him to a tournament. And I think it was in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And he won. And they call me and they go, there's a tournament this afternoon in LaGrange, Kentucky, and he can get in and he really wants to play. I go, are you kidding me? I mean, he went down there like at eight o'clock and played in this tournament. There were nine holes at that age. And he really wanted to go to this other tournament. And uh, I'm like, look, whatever he wants to do, that that's fine. I go, that, that's a lot. But, you know, he just, that's the way he was. He just, whatever he did, he wanted to do more. And he went to this, uh, one in LaGrange and he won that. So we called it, uh, we joked about it for weeks about the junior slam. You, you won the junior slam. You won two separate. I think one of them was a, at the time, I think it was called the Pepsi tour that, that the Kentucky PGA ran. And then I think there was like a Muslim done tour junior tour. And, and he won one of each, of the two different tours, or they may have been both Pepsi events. I, I don't remember, but he won two different events on the same day. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> no, that's super cool. And it's, it's fun to hear about those stories too, because we have so many players where, like you said, they just want to play in everything. Obviously we have, you can play in five open events in a year, but I feel like there's so many times where I'm I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I would say there's so many times where somebody like qualifies for a tournament one day. And then we ask them if they want to play and they go, Oh, well I'm actually supposed to play in something else tomorrow. Let me call and see if I can like change it or fix it. So it's just, that mentality is just so go, go, go. Sometimes it's, it's kind of baffling to see. I, I'll tell you another funny story. Uh, Cause I don't think I'll implicate anybody here is uh, we were playing in this tournament one time and it was in Lexington, Kentucky. So I could, I could go to it. And, you know, Justin had won. I don't know whether it was a plantation event or a Pepsi tour event. I forget what it was, but you know, he, he won every single event he played in. And he was a couple down with uh, three or four holes to go. I think I think it was three holes to go. He was three or four down with three holes to go. And I can remember the golf course. I remember the course and I remember the holes. And I see him talking to this kid walking down 16T. And this kid comes over and he goes, did you hear what he just said? And I'm like, Oh my God, well, what did he say to you now? You know, <laughs> and he, it wasn't the kid that he was down to. And he told this kid, he said, watch what happens here. He goes, I'm four down. He goes, I purposely hit a three wood off the tee so I could hit first into the green. I'm going to hit it close and make birdie and I'm going to be three down. He's going to be so rattled on 17 that he's going to make bogey. I'm going to make birdie, and I'm only going to be one down. And then I'm going to bury the last hole and tie or beat him there. And that's exactly what he did. And I thought to myself, <laughs> I remember that. I go, who thinks that way? I mean, <laughs> that was the kind of stuff that I, when I alluded to earlier, that whatever the situation was, uh, you know, when I think back at my junior golf days, you know, I'd be frustrated that I can't 
can't beat this kid. I can't catch him. And he had it fully laid out how this was going to happen. And he felt so good about it that he told the third person in his group <laughs> who wasn't in contention <laughs> that this is how this is going to happen. And that's exactly what he did. He hit it really close on 16, made birdie, and he birdied uh, 17, and the, the boy made bogey, and then he beat him on 18. And it was game over. And I'm like, that's crazy. And we told him that story on their drive home. I go, you know, this kid came over and told us this. He goes, really? I go, yeah, that's what he was coming over to tell us. That I, I thought he had smarted, you'd smarted off to him or you had said something <laughs> bad to him. I go, that's, that's just crazy that someone at that age thinks that way. Yeah. Say so that's just confidence you can't teach, <laughs> right. but it's you hear stories like that and you think how many kids are really thinking like that? Like that's one of those things that you have to think truly kind of sets him apart from some of the others who are trying to do the same thing. I forget who they were playing. I think Dale Brown was the coach at LSU and I forget who they were playing. It was a tournament game or something. And they were down by three or four with 20 seconds to go. And they called him into the huddle and you know, they had the mics on him and Dale Brown told him, this is how it's going to go. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. We're going to win this game. Not in overtime. We're going to win at regulation. And that's exactly what happened. I was like, I mean, obviously, he was a great coach. I mean, he instead of fretting that he had to make up four points in 20 seconds, he just told his team, this is how it's going to happen. And that's what happened. It's crazy. Did you have to kind of manage, I don't know, did Justin have a lot of expectations winning so many events, you know, that young? Did you have to kind of manage that? Uh, definitely. I mean, he put a serious amount of pressure on himself to succeed. Uh he wasn't a very good loser, and, uh, you know, I don't think he had enough experience at losing. And, um, you know, there was a time, there was a time where uh, my wife's leaving. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, there was a time where I think he finished second one time, and uh, because of Tiger Woods, I think his line was, uh, uh, I forget what is it, uh, second is the, I forget what his line was about finishing second, but obviously Justin got the second place trophy at this event and he wouldn't go up and get it. And we're like, <laughs> you're going up to get that trophy. And, and he, wouldn't, he wouldn't go get it. And I go, you know, we were pulling out all the parent stops that we could of, you know, there's so many kids here that would love to finish second. Da, 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 da. And it finally ended with, if, if you don't go up and get that, I can't tell you when your next event is going to be. And, and that, that's the one that, that got him up there. He's <laughs> like, well, there's one coming up this week that I want to play. And then that's what finally got him up there. But yeah, we had to manage, you know, there were so many times that I, I remember one, one time that he was probably 10. I mean, he was literally at the club seven days a week at age 10. He was there eight hours a day, nine hours a day. His, his mom would drop him off. He'd be there all day long. I'd see him here and there, but you know, I was busy doing a lot of the club duties and I remember one time I told him, I go, look, Justin, I go, we might have been home that night. And I said, why don't you just stay home for a day or two? Just stay home, play basketball with your buddies, go ride your bike, uh, you know, go hang out. Just just do some 10-year-old stuff, you know, go, go goof off for a couple of days and just rest up. And he agreed that that was a good idea. And at about 930, I see Janie pulling up with Justin, gets out of the car in his golf clothes and walks up and I go, well, what happened to uh, taking the day off? He goes, I was bored. <laughs> <laughs> he just, he couldn't do it. I mean, he just, he couldn't take a day off. And I probably contrary to most parents approach, uh, I tried to, I didn't try to keep him from playing, but I tried to offer some balance in his life and, and he didn't want it. He wanted nothing but golf, nothing but golf. So. I think it's it's funny, too, because we talk about all the balance and everything. And I think maybe for a kid like Justin, it was a little different where you don't exactly see him having the build to go suit up on a football field. But it's just fun to see that. Again, it's he somewhere played, anybody. Can yeah, compete. he played other sports when he was little. He really when he was five or six, he really enjoyed soccer. Uh, he liked baseball. He was way too scrawny to play football. Um, and uh, he played basketball probably up until seventh grade or something. I mean, he, he liked that. I mean, he was, he was slow and 
could shoot a little bit, but uh, yeah, golf was always always his passion. Dang, that's awesome. Um, do you just kind of from a coaching perspective is there is there a skill or quality that you kind of really encourage every single one of your students to have that that maybe you kind of pulled from from your experience with Justin? Um, I mean, every single one of my students, I stress short game. And uh, I always tell them, you can out short game your ball striking, but you can out you cannot out ball strike your short game, because no matter how good you're hitting it, you're going to have to get up and down to keep that score going, or you're going to have to make that putt to convert a birdie or so forth. Uh, so my number one skill that I always stress uh, is short game. I mean, the game is from 70 or 80 yards in. And you got to get better at that part. No matter how good you think you are at it, you got to get better at it. And uh, I always enjoyed working on my short game, and I think that's that kind of bled into Justin. You know, if I had 15 minutes to burn at my job, I was probably going to go hit bunker shots or chip or putt. And I, I think he saw that, and and at an early age, again, I never asked him to work on a short game more. I just think that if he wanted to hang around with Dad for those 15 minutes, it was going to be around a chipping green. So I would say number one, short game. Number two is I love to get them out on the golf course. I mean, all my young students, I like doing it with adults too, but all my young students, the very first time I see them, we're going out on the golf course for nine holes. I want to watch them get out of trouble. I want to watch them. I actually would rather them play poorly and see how they handle it. And, you know, a line that I always use is, a good player turns a 41 into a 39, you know, a good player turns a 79 into a 76. And when you teed off, you didn't want 76, but when you were looking at 79, 76 is all of a sudden a good prize. So, you know, I want to see a good score for me anytime. anytime I well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see how they handle themselves on the golf course. So number one, short game. Number two is like course management. I want to see them get around the golf course and then probably number three, something that I learned a lot more about once I started getting out on tour and starting to be around other uh, teachers and so forth is a lot more performance practice to where a lot of our practice with juniors, once we've got their golf swing or their technique pitching or chipping or whatever, once we've got that to where we want it, we immediately go into performance practice where we're going to grade your performance in this. So the line that I always use with students is you want your practice to simulate on course as much as possible. And on course, when you're hitting a seven iron into a par four, you don't get a bucket of balls to do it. You get one. So we may hit one club at a time. We may hit wedges to five different targets, but only one target at a time. You don't get two balls to one target because you don't get two balls in the golf course, you know, putting, all of our drills is one putt to an area. It might be a drill with, with 12 putts, but they're 12 different putts. That way, you're not fooling yourself through repetition that you're succeeding. You're succeeding because your thought process and your mechanics are good. Um, I like that, and I feel like that's a different way of thinking about it. I think sometimes you see players just out there from the same spot hitting 15 putts at a time. Yeah. And so I think it's really kind of a different way of thinking. And Mike, something else I kind of wondered about, obviously you were formerly working with Justin back when he was young to now coaching these new generation of youth golfers. How has that changed with technology progressing the way it has from a training perspective with the new club and ball technology? I'd have to imagine that's had a big impact. Oh yeah. It's, it's had a, it's had a huge impact. Um, you know, I was probably one of the very early users in Kentucky of video uh, and having the monitor out there on the tee. When that became available, uh, uh, kind of drove my wife nuts that I was always coming home with some new $1,000 camera that had <laughs> super slow-mo or something. She's like, what are you that for? And I was like, this, this is the best. This is the best that you can get to break something down, stop and slow-mo and frame by frame and stuff like that. Um, obviously when I was teaching Justin and when I was teaching back then, there weren't launch monitors and stuff and the launch monitors have come to show us that some of the things that we thought on ball flight, as far as face and path are, were actually incorrect. The old ball flight laws were, 
were actually 180 degrees from what they actually are today. And so we have the benefit of all the technology with launch monitors and everything. I think it has hurt uh, some kids, uh, these launch monitors, where they're trying to get to a certain number. You know, if yeah. they're fortunate enough to have a full swing or a quad or a track man or foresight or something to where they're working too hard on getting this number versus what is your ball doing? You know, maybe a, a number of, a, for instance, a path and a face number that is good for me would not be good for this person over here. You know, as an example, I'm inside out. So I'm always looking to reduce my path number less to the right as a right-handed golfer. Justin's a cutter. So we always want to see his path numbers be a little bit to the left. So if kids don't understand that technology, they're going to work towards something that they shouldn't be doing. So it, uh, anytime I work with a track man with students, I go through and explain a lot to them what's happening and the feedback we're getting from the track man numbers. But within two or three lessons, depending on their age and their skill level, I, I don't let them look at those track man numbers. I tell, I ask them to tell me what happened and then I can look and see, then I'll show them the track man numbers and go, yeah, you were correct or no, no, it wasn't your face. It was your path. That way they can practice more efficiently that, you know, for instance, if somebody's hooking the ball a lot and I've had good players come to me and tell me they're coming over top of it and they're pulling everything and I'll show them on track man. I go, no, the fact of the matter is, you're swinging too far to the right, which is making the ball hook too much. So you're working on swinging to the right when that's the problem in the first place. So, you know, this technology is only as good as you understand it. And it's important for these juniors to not get wrapped up in these numbers and more to get wrapped up in the numbers that are important to, to them in particular. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, to transition a little bit here, let's let's talk about the the Justin Thomas Junior Championship, and obviously that event's been going on for a number of years now, and you've been, had a huge hand in um, kind of organizing that and doing all that stuff, as well as I know Justin makes some decisions and and on our side too. Talk a little bit about that event and kind of what it's become, because it's I mean it's one of the top open tournaments on the AJJ schedule now. Yeah, I mean we're we're very very proud of that event. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, the AJGA does a great job. I mean, it's run like a professional event. Uh, the kids see that, uh, and, and that's why they want to play in these AJGA events because they're so well run. Uh, you know, the members that give up the golf course for that week, uh, they they get behind it. Uh, all the sponsors that I have in Kentucky and, and, and m many right there at the club in the local area, but some, you know, outside of Kentucky, you know, the sponsors have got behind the – the uh, the cause that we're doing and it's easy for them when I send them those fulfillment reports or I send them dollars raised and stuff it's easy for them to to say hey put me down for this next year too and I always stress to Justin you know when I was I was on the board of directors uh, for the Kentucky section for 22 years or so and then I was a national director for the PGA of America so I was in a lot of volunteer positions to do things and I knew the benefit of uh, volunteering for things and I used to all and I would take Justin to some of them with me and I think he quickly understood I forget the line but you know the more you give the more you get and, and I literally got I feel like I got more out of working uh, you know with disabled kids or if you know, whether it was the Boys and Girls Club or the First Tee and things like that. I, I really, when I'd come home, I'd go, I think I got more out of that than they did. I mean, I enjoyed that so much. So probably the proudest thing uh, that I have uh, attached to this uh, Justin Thomas Jr. Championship is the fact that Justin uh, has gotten behind it too and, and gives up his time to come. Uh, I think that's really important for the sponsors. I think it's really important for the player, for the juniors that are playing. And I think it's important for Justin to see the impact, uh, you know, as we constantly tell him that, you know, this was you not too long ago. And what would it have meant for you to have one of your tour players that you look up to come and show up for this event? And, I mean, Jay and I both stress to him that we can't 
thank him enough for for his involvement in this and uh we said when, when he got involved in different charities and when he started his foundation you know i would tell him you know anybody can write a check that's that's not hard to do and you can you can write a big check i mean you can afford it and it's not going to have any impact on on your lifestyle but anybody can write a check but to be involved and get behind it and be personally involved in the event that has a bigger impact than the check's going to have so you know we're very proud of him that he has continued to support this event uh, in person both financially and showing up and conversing with the sponsors and the kids it means a bunch of us yeah i got some numbers from the event i guess it's raised over a million dollars for charitable giving it's received 12 ajj tournament awards and you recently added that 500 hundred dollar stipend program for players coming to play to kind of make access to the event even even bigger so it definitely has had a huge impact not just on the AJJ, but I think junior golf and kind of some of the efforts to make golf even more accessible for people out there. Yeah. Well, we appreciate everything that you all do on your end. And, uh, you know, our goal from day one was to make it the best event in the country. And we're always looking to what can we do better to, to improve this event. And I think one of those things that I've come to enjoy is, uh, for a few years, I was fortunate enough to run Jordan Spieth's event and obviously their friendship, their kind of rivalry they have is something that I think, any golf fan enjoys seeing and so i love that the events are kind of held closely together and you always see the back and forth on social media some of that content that they produce that's always fairly targeted whether it's the the texas alabama rivalry whether it's just whatever's going on in the golf world i think it's so cool to see that they bring that with them to those two events yeah it's a funny story when uh we were approached about justin endowing a uh, ace grant uh tim you may know this story um i think it was a hundred thousand dollars and when we heard that uh jordan did one for a hundred thousand dollars i should have kept the canceled check back back then we probably had canceled checks now they're all digital <laughs> but when we found out that jordan did one for a hundred thousand dollars we made our check out for a hundred thousand one dollar <laughs> just, just to spite jordan <laughs> just one more dollar <laughs> yeah i think we i think we still have that big check that you uh took photos with i think we still have that i think actually ryan flanagan has that in his office it's pretty funny to go look and everybody's like one hundred thousand to one dollar why is that and it's always a great story <laughs> but that's typical of those two i mean jordan would have done the same thing if he was the second one to do it yeah, it's so cool to see them see them give back. Um, have there been any kind of standout moments or special moments from the tournament um, over the last few years that really kind of stand out to you? I mean, probably the the biggest moments for me is is the kids and the parents that come up and thank us that and tell us that this is the best event they play in. You know, each year, uh, you know, I've over the years I've gotten to know some of the returnees. Uh, you know, sometimes you. Uh, a senior may get in only their senior year, so I only get to see them once. But the returnees that have played from 14, age 14 or 15 on, both the boys and the girls, I've heard a number of times of them saying, you know, I only had a couple events I was going to play in this year. It's my senior year, and I, I saved a place for this one. I wanted this to be my last AJGA event. And, you know, that means a lot to us. That tells us we're doing something right, that they want to come back and re return and uh, – you know, those are probably uh, our family's uh, best moments is, is understanding and getting thanks for the efforts that we're putting forward and, and that we're doing something right because uh, it has a special place on the calendar for them. Certainly a special one. We always hear great things about it. It's turned into, like Tim mentioned, one of the top open events on the schedule. And I know you mentioned always trying to grow and improve. Are there any goals that you have moving forward for the event or anything you'd like to see kind of as we progress year to year? Well, obviously, uh, money drives everything. Um, you know, I'm not sure we're at a million dollars yet. I think we're close. Uh, I, I, I keep track of that from year to year. And, uh, you know, money, money, unfortunately, is, is what makes it happen. You know, the more we can raise, the more we can give back to the local community. Uh, the tournament benefits the Boys and Girls Club in Kentuckyana. And it also... Uh, benefits uh, the first tees uh we do a lot of first tees around the country and we also do a lot with uh usa cares which is uh, the mil it, it benefits military families uh and usa cares is headquartered in louisville 
So the more money we can raise, the more that we can give to these charities. And, you know, obviously that's incumbent on getting the sponsors to return and uh, raise as much sponsorship dollars as we can. Nice. Uh, before we go, I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of you and your your career and kind of the legacy of your family, because I know that um, you have a really rich history um, with, you know, PGA professionals and your family. Talk a little bit about how you kind of became that and talk a little bit about your dad and kind of that progression of the legacy. Yeah, my late father was uh, was a PGA member and was at a club for 30 years. Uh, he was also a really good player. He played in a couple national championships pgas and u.s opens uh u.s senior opens uh, i always joke that the the golfing uh gene skipped a generation with, with me uh i think my dad and justin are, were both a little bit better than i was uh but i was competitive in, in the section uh, events uh I, I was one of those guys that could have good rounds or really poor rounds whereas justin and my dad both with well, their poor rounds were a lot better than my poor rounds but you know, I learned a lot from my father. My father liked to teach a lot. Uh, so I, I kind of picked that up from him. Um, I was very fortunate uh, to work for a number of really good PGA uh, professionals at, when I was an assistant. And so, you know, they mentored me uh, in my young career. And then I was uh, fortunate once I went to Harmony Landing to uh, have a membership that supported me. They certainly supported Justin at a very early age. They loved having him out there when he was very young. And, you know, no matter what you do in life, you, you, you need right things happen to you. You need to come across the right people and you need to have people come into your life that are going to have a great influence on you uh, to further your career, to better your career. You know, my involvement with... Uh, at the section level uh, early on, you know, as they say, uh, the more you got up and, and griped at a section meeting or any meeting, the more you're going to be appointed to some committee, <laughs> which uh, involved me getting on committees, which involved me running for the board, which involved me run, going through all the offices from a secretary to president in Kentucky and then ended with me as a national director. And again, you know, the people that I crossed paths with from the national and the section level, you know, they had a big impact on my career. You know, I learned from all the people that I was around, uh, different ways to do things in business or better ways to teach, uh, better ways to interact with your customers. So uh, I certainly have had a uh, blessed life in between uh, my late father and Justin and I, uh, yeah, golf has been very, very good to us for sure. I think it's just, it's super cool, the family involvement of it all. And I think that's one of those things where I always think to when you watch the PNC every year, when you see those the families out there playing together. You know, could you tell us a little bit about that experience and kind of what that means to you to have that opportunity to play with Justin in an event like that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a blast for us. Uh, you know, I think the first year we played uh, maybe was because uh, Tiger won charlie wanted to play with tiger and tiger called justin and said why don't you play in this and and we'll play with you and that was a kind of a nerve-wracking moment for me because i'd never played in front of a a crowd of people that that tiger creates when when he's out there on the golf course <laughs> but you know contrary to what a lot of people probably believe i don't get to play much golf with justin you know he's either playing on tour or he's practicing when he's home and you know, he has very little spare time to do nothing. And now with the family, you know, his, it's not going to get any better. And the last thing that is on his mind is, uh, you know, go, going to play nine holes or 18 holes with me. Uh, we do get to do that now and then, but not near as often as probably either one of us would like to. Um, but that's a, you know, a great time of the year it's in december uh it's so it's kind of a downtime for him and it kind of gets him out there in some kind of competition before uh, the season starts in january uh it truly is a great event the uh, the staff there at the, the golf course in the pnc they, they do a wonderful job with that event and it's a blast for me to see some of the young kids like uh i think his name's will sorenstam and, and some of the other younger kids out there, you know, it's just so cool to see that interaction between the, the parents and their children out there. Uh, that's an event we look forward to every year for sure. Yeah. 
Uh, last question I have. Uh, what does it feel like becoming a grandpa? What is that? What is that like? Talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, it probably really hasn't hit me yet. Uh, I'm kind of one of those people that don't really think about something until it's on your lap. Uh, I don't project out into what what's going to be. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to, to being a grandfather. Uh, I think my wife is probably, you know, being being female, I think they get a lot more excited about those things and, you know, already purchasing gifts and things for the baby and stuff. I think a lot of fathers uh, or grandfathers, uh, uh, I'm excited about it, but it, it'll hit me when I see her, you know, that that's when it's going to hit me. That's awesome. Well, Mike, we really appreciate you taking the time today to chat with us. It was good, good to see you. Um, I'll have to make it back up there to the event again here in the near future, hopefully. Yeah, but... come on up and see us. We're, we're glad to have you, and we, we appreciate everything the AJGA does. I mean, you're a top-notch organization, and uh, there's a reason why all the kids want to play on, on your tour is because it's the best. For sure. Awesome. Well, thanks, Mike. We appreciate it. I hope you have a, a great rest of your day. You do the same. Thank you all. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Ah, oh, such a great guest. I love having love having him on, being able to talk to him. It's that event actually is really cool. I've been I went to the I think one of the first ones where it was at Harmony Landing, which is the course that uh, Justin grew up on, and then also I went back to a couple more. And it's just so cool how they've embraced it. I mean, they raise so much money every year. Everybody's involved. Kentucky's just got something going on because we got a couple events there that are super involved from that kind of financial end. So it's really cool to see that. And obviously he's got some great stories too. So, yeah, I mean, great guy. And just the way you can tell he's so invested in it, the way you can tell Justin is, it's just kind of a whole family affair there. It's just some that's super interesting event that I've never personally been to, but hear a lot of great things about. So super cool to see where that goes. Um, love to get to it at some point and see, see what it's all about, but very happy to have him on big. Thanks to Mike. And, um, doing great things on the podcast here, getting great guests like Mike. It's cool to see him from different perspectives there, but then also, um, some cool things to look forward to as we got here coming up on the podcast in December, keep an eye out. We, uh, we're looking at doing a holiday episode, maybe having some, oh, yeah. some unofficial awards out there. So if you're listening in, if you got some, some awards that you'd like to see some, uh, some obscure things that you'd like. What's us the one to you kind said to me the through. best flow on the AJGA tour? Is that what? Yeah, you I've been doing an, an in-depth deep dive into some <laughs> of the flow on the AJGA. Um, we've got some great hair out there. I mean, we've got some leaders in the clubhouse coming to mind. But uh, if you have anybody in mind for some of those, be sure to send in. We'll accept submissions there. So, um, like to get you guys involved. Just keeping it fun, keeping it light, and uh, hopefully close out the year on a high note. Yeah, we should have done that award a couple years ago. You remember Jake Bieber Frankel? Oh, I that mean, flow was number unreal. one great name, but <laughs> also the hair was phenomenal. <laughs> unreal, unreal. Okay, awesome. Well, um, if you like Tom said, if you had any of that stuff, send it over to us on uh, social media. That'd be awesome. We are obviously on social media: AJJ Golf on X, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn. Did I say Facebook? Facebook. All the, all the things. So just uh, go follow us in there. Definitely message us if you um, have any the stuff Thomas said or really any questions. I think we'll try to do questions again here in the next couple of episodes also. Um, but that's kind of all I've got. Thomas, you got anything else? No, I think great episode. And like I said, looking forward to seeing how we close out the year here. Exciting time here at the AJGA. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Tom, have a good rest of your day. You too, Tim. Have a good one.